let me get right into it. Uh, Jesus' mission was fivefold. And so here's what he came to do. One, he came to restore the kingdom. Two, he came to reconcile the world to the Father. Three, he came to reign and uh, be enthroned in the heavens. Four, he came to reclaim people from all over the earth. And five, he came so he could return to judge and be Lord. So let me go over that list of five things. One, he came to restore the kingdom. So that's one of the reasons Jesus came. He said, I've come to restore the kingdom. Two, he came to uh, reconcile the world to the Father. Let me show you the Father. And he showed us the Father. And he said, the only way to the Father is through me. And if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Three, he came to reign. And in his dying and then being raised again and being given a place that is above every other name, he reigns now. He is Lord. Four, he came to reclaim from across the earth peoples from every tribe, nation, and color. Five, he will come back. He will return. Now, the first three things he's already done. He's restored the kingdom. He's reconciled the world to the Father through the cross. He now reigns enthroned in heaven, which is why he said those words in Matthew 28 when he said, go therefore, because all authority has been given to me. He will return. So he takes care of four out of the five, but he leaves one undone. I mean, he decides that he won't do all of it. The first three parts are achieved. The fifth part he'll take care of, but the fourth part he doesn't complete. That he leaves to his body. That's a huge task, eh? Here's what he's left us to do. He's left us to gather people into his kingdom from all parts of the earth. And somehow, even though Paul in Ephesians 3.10 says, I have made it plain to you what the nature of the church is. That the church will present to the world the manifold wisdom of God, both to, the, both to the world and to the rulers and the principalities and powers. And even though Paul made it really clear, the church has somehow lost its way. And the one thing we aren't very concerned about is this whole idea of reclaiming people from every tribe, tongue, and nation into the kingdom. So we're big on everything else but this one thing. And a church that does not function in this fourth request, that, not request, command that Jesus has, is a church that will never face scorn or opposition. Scorn and opposition of the world and of the demonic realm is only reserved for churches that engage in the fourth command. This is why most of us don't face scorn. This is why most of us don't face much opposition. Because most of the things we do are for internal building up. While Jesus' intent was, I just have one primary reason for your existence. I'll give you the faith you need. Go strong and be mighty in faith like Daryl was saying. I'll give you the healing you need. I'll give you the money you need. But it's all for one purpose. It was never meant for you. It was supposed to be wasted out there on people who don't deserve it in our eyes. Because someone did that for you. That's why you're seat sitting here today. Someone expended their grace, their anointing, their wealth, their inconvenience on me and you, and we end up sitting here. But then we become fat cats because we keep eating, but it's for our own benefit. And Jesus is saying it was never about you. Never about you. And so, if you could put it in other words, here's what Christ is saying. I'm building my church, and I'm not sending angels to gather people into the church. I'm sending you. Those angels will minister to you, but they ain't going out to get people in. And by the way, he says, I don't care much for this building either. Because when I said I would tear down something, I meant a building. But when I said I would raise up something, I meant a people. So he tore down a building and raised up a people. (laughs) 
And so he now wants us to go out and gather people into a people, not into a building. Because he really doesn't care where you meet because he can turn up everywhere, shut the door on him, and he walks right in anyways. <laughs> Did that after he rose again. And so Christ is building the church. The agents of uh, Christ are not angels but us because he calls us disciples. And, and one way to deci define disciples is disciples are people who have been set apart for Christ to assist him in setting others apart. Disciples are people who have been set apart by Christ to assist Christ in setting others apart. That's the only reason for existence. How do we intend to be ble a blessing to all the nations? We get stuck on blessing the nations through the money we have. That is possible. But when God said to Abraham in Genesis 12 that you will become a blessing to all nations, what he really meant was, Abraham, you found me. Through you will come a seed which will cause the pagans, the Gentiles, the rest of everybody seated right now in Carmel to be gathered, and you shall therefore be a blessing to him. In the bargain, I'll bless them with health and wealth and a a few other things that the world is concerned about. But my primary intent when I said you shall be a blessing to the nations is that you will go out and gather them in just as you have been gathered in by me. Amen. That at the core is the Abrahamic blessing. Everything else is not fluff but peripheral. Ouch. <laughs> so we need to break away from the understanding and this is a common understanding in churches, uh, and uh, it, it used to be my understanding too. We need to break away from the understanding that Christ died and rose again to forgive you and to give you eternal life so that you can follow his teachings and thereby have him protect your family and make you successful. You, in turn, will attend church, which is a beautiful spiritual gathering on Sundays, where spiritual leaders help you spiritually. That sounds about right? Yes. <laughs> so that's what we've reduced it to. And we need to break away from that understanding because it's so about us, eh? Yes. Yes. It is about him during the worship, but it's still kind of about us. Yes. And here is how we need to think, that I have been set aside by God's grace, and my entire life, it doesn't matter whether I'm a janitor who can sing or a physically challenged painter who has to hold the brush between my teeth or my toes. It doesn't matter whether I'm an unemployed designer or a student leader or a junior soccer player who isn't good at studies. My life, my entire life plays a critical part in his big story and his big story is very simple. Go therefore and make all disciples when you play soccer. Go therefore and make disciples when you're looking for a designer job. Go therefore and make disciples while you hold that brush between your teeth and paint a picture because your hands and legs don't work. Go therefore and make disciples even though you're a janitor or a doorman who keeps opening doors but you have the ability to sing and lead people and when you stand people listen. Go therefore and make disciples. This is his story and every life that he has shaped with certain gifts, talents, abilities, is only for one purpose, one purpose only. Go therefore and make disciples. Amen. There is no other reason for your existence. Amen. There is no other reason for you holding the job you hold. There is no other reason for you having the talent you have. There is no other reason for you having the gifts or the abilities you have. There is no reason for the segment of society you're in. There is no reason for the streets you walk in other than to be aware of the people that walk in the street. There is no reason for the sphere of influence you have. There is no reason for the stage of life you are in except this one thing. Amen. Go therefore and make disciples. Amen. Guys, we got to set everything else aside. Everything else aside, because everything else will burn. You'll escape by the seat of your pants. Your security in terms of heaven is um, taken care of. But everything else will burn. This is what we've been called to. And thank God, eh? Because the other stuff, I'm getting bored of. <laughs> Give me a challenge that that really makes it difficult to live this Christian life. 
Give me something I can really work at. That's what God wants to throw, throw you away today. What is his story? His story is very simple. If our lives are to be part of his story, we need to know his story. And his story is very simple. He is building his church. I mean, when you ask people, what is Jesus doing now? Our usual response is seated in heaven, which is true. Uh, our usual response is he's interceding for us, which is true. Our usual response is he's building mansions for us, which is kind of, <clears throat> uh, we'll talk about that another time. <laughs> what a way to sell heaven, eh? Bigger mansions. Trump does that better than pastors. His story is that I am building my church. I'm still building my church. And therefore, I expect you to assist me because this is the reason I set you apart. And he expects not Ralph to do it, not Wayne to do it, not these guys sitting in the first row. It is expected, oh, let's include the second row because they felt left out suddenly. <laughs> Rick, you're feeling okay now? Good. Anything to make you feel important, man. <laughs> Sorry. So, God didn't say this to the first two rows. Because that's, again, where we get stuck, eh? Because some are called pastors and because some perhaps get paid or because some went to Bible school, we think that this command was only meant for the first two rows, when it is for you, unpaid, unschooled, pedigree-less nobodies. Amen. How's that for encouragement? <laughs> it is meant for all of us, guys. Now that I know you guys, well, I've got to tell you this. I did go to Bible school, but I didn't get through. <laughs> Too late, Ralph. <laughs> yeah. So... He expects us, all of us here, unpaid, unschooled, pedigree-less disciples to engage those that he paid a price to rescue. He expects all of us to do that. It cannot be left to... I was, at a, uh, I was um, near the Bangladesh border 10 days ago, and um, we had about 1,500 people turn up for those meetings, and um, it was a mission meeting. And... Um, Here's what I did. I had uh, the 1,500 stand up first, and then I said, um, how many missionaries here? 32. 32 missionaries had to carry the weight of the entire church, <laughs> covering an area that's four times the size of Wales. 32 missionaries did that. Well, f f I don't know how math works. F one, 1,468 people sat around giving plenty to the offering, even praying, but not going. And that's our condition too. Most of the work is done by the guys in the first two rows, or let's say you're hidden somewhere else. Most of the guys are, most of the work is done by the leaders. The rest of us pay for it, and we do very little else. And it's not your fault. I'd say it's half, half the fault of the leaders, half your fault. Let's share the blame. And so God wants to change this. Amen. And that's what we'll talk about. Because it's impossible for Ralph to engage the Samaritan, the magician, the governor, the Greek philosopher, the demonized girl, the Ethiopian eunuch, the Pharisee, the jailer, the merchant, the rich man, the blind man, the beggar, the soldier, the sailor, the thief. It's impossible for Ralph to engage them all. But you can, because some of you work in places where you find Ethiopian eunuchs who are treasurers and financiers. You can, because you might find a magician or two where you work. You can, because you might find a jailer. You might even find a thief. You can, because you might find a Greek philosopher or a demonized girl, because there are places you go to that no pastor has any access. This is why God has brought together a church like Carmel, we're working in so many different places with so many different talents and abilities. And God is just waiting for each of us to be released into doing what he set you apart for. Yeah. And we won't be able to stand before God and say, but Ralph didn't tell us this. Because he's been kind of saying it for the last while.
So this cannot be done by Ralph or Wayne or Michael or a few leaders. And you can't learn to live like this through a 40-minute sermon on a Sunday. And so Jesus has other plans, and you can find those plans in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And I've said this before, but Jesus didn't just leave 12 disciples to handle the rest of the world. I remember saying this about two or three months ago. Look at how smart Jesus was. He knew 12 couldn't handle the influx of disciples that would happen on the first day in Pentecost. 3,000 joined the church on the first day. 5,000 shortly after. But look at what he did. He had the 12, and we know their names, kind of. And then he had the 72. Know any of the 72? Huh, you don't know their names. What about the 120? Know, know the names of any of the 120 that were waiting in the upper room when the Holy Spirit fell? Nope. Do you know the names of the 512 that Jesus met after he rose from the dead? Nope. Do you know the other 12 apostles mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 6 to 8? There were another 12 apostles. What? Yes, there were. I'm not kidding you. You can actually read it. He first met with the 12 and then he met with another 12. Apostles. So he had a good bunch of 600 people ready and waiting because he knew what was going to happen. And he knew most people can't handle more than 8 to 10 families. That's the extent to which anybody can go. Jesus, who I would suggest to you was pretty good at this, could at best handle 12 families. 12 disciples, 12 families, sufficiently large families. At best, a person can handle 48 or 50 people if you want to train them and bring them up well. Anything beyond 50 is impossible to handle. And therefore, we have to come in on a Sunday, gather together, 300 or 400 of us, drink for 40 minutes, and then sustain ourselves with what we've drunk for the rest of the week. Impossible. Jesus being smart already took care of it. In Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, he says that, uh, starting at 41, he says, then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And here's what he said, they must continue in steadfastly. In apostles' doctrine, all it means is a set of teachings brought to you by your leaders. In those days, the leaders were the apostles, so apostles' doctrine or teaching. In our case, it would be a common set of teachings brought to you by your leaders. The second thing he said was critical to the church functioning as it should function was the breaking of bread. And this was not some secret thing that was done in, uh, within these walls. The breaking of bread w- was a thing that was practiced openly. Practiced openly. Just imagine how different it would be eh? if you call someone over for supper and halfway through the meal you actually take some bread and say something like, hey, this bread gives us strength and uh, just want you to know that this is exactly what Jesus did when he gave his life so that we may be strengthened. Something as irreligious and as deep meaning as that. And while you're pouring out juice, you say to the people gathered around your table that Most gods demand an offering, but strange, Jesus poured his life out as an offering. And that's all you say. Where the breaking of bread becomes a a public declaration of who you believe in, what he did. Every other religion has a ritual that they practice openly. And we, as Christians, give them space and respect and sometimes frown at it, but they all have it. But the only religion that actually has a life-giving ritual is practiced within the uh, within the enclosures of these walls, and the world never knows what we are publicly declaring. Every other religion speaks out the names of their gods openly, sometimes five times a day, sometimes ten times a day. But the only name that can change things is a name that is rarely spoken outside these walls by us. And God is saying, hey, I don't want it to be done by ministers and leaders. I want the entire church to begin to say it. Because when 500 people whisper, secrets get known, man. Otherwise, Mike Fletcher has to come and and really shout his lungs out like that song says. Or Daryl has to come and make us shout Jesus three times. 
But what if there were 600 whispers this week? This is what we're being called to. This kind of Christianity will weed out disciples who stay in and disciples who walk out. That happens, you know. And I pray God that it happens even while I'm speaking. Because we must know where we stand. We must know where we stand. In a church, we must know where we stand. Strangely enough, in John 6, 66. In John 6, 66. In, in John 6, 66, it actually says, and some of the disciples found it really hard to take what Jesus was saying, and his disciples walked away. So there are two kinds of disciples, and there is nothing in between, eh? There's nothing in between. You can't be, I'm a believer. You, you can't be a believer once you start believing you become a disciple. I'm a convert. Too bad you got converted. You're no longer a convert. You're now a disciple. Because that's the only category. What did Jesus say? If you can't do this or that, you are not worthy to be a believer. Nope. You're not worthy to be a convert. Nope. You are not even worthy to be my disciple. And amongst disciples, there are two kinds. The ones that stay in as the message gets tougher and they stay in because they want to obey and the ones that walk away because it is too tough to chew and therefore they walk away. After hearing this, um, it'll be tough for us to ignore it, eh? First time I heard this, I wish I hadn't heard it. Apostles' doctrine, breaking of bread. And the third one was fellowship. A and it is so not what we guys do. The whole idea of fellowship was this beautiful two-worded uh, thing called one anothering. One anothering. One anothering. We one another. What does that look like? We serve one another. We are hospitable to be one another. We spur one another to good works. We stir one another up so that we begin to live passionately. We love one another. We are hospitable to one another. We uh, encourage one another. This is what it was supposed to look like, fellowship. It was never meant to be a 15-minute thing after church where we have coffee and cookies. It was one anothering. And the number of one another's you find in the New Testament is fascinating. This was what we were supposed to do. It was also supposed to be the expression of gifts. Where in this church right now, let's assume there are 300 people. There are at least 300 different people with one or two gifts. But it so happens that in most of our services in churches like Carmel or the church that I pastor, is that the only two gifts that are usually expressed are the gift of tongues and prophecy by the same culprits. And I meant that in a very respectful way. The usual suspects come and prophesy and the rest of us hear it and that's about it. What about the rest of the gifts? What will happen if you don't get a chance to express your gift? How am I going to benefit from what you have in you that was meant for me? Guys, there is a solution at the end of this. And it's not a grassroots movement or something. Nothing in Christianity happens through grassroots movements. It's always top down. It's not a democracy. It is a kingdom. Yeah. Nothing starts from the grassroots. Anything that starts from the grassroots in the kingdom is called rebellion. <laughs> so it's a bad idea to ask for consensus in a church or um, ask the entire congregation, what do you think? How should we go about it? Really bad idea. The last time that happened, Barabbas was set free and Jesus was crucified. <laughs> so you don't want to go down that route. So it's best that we understand this is a kingdom. And so it's top down. And the audacity I have to teach this message is because uh, your leaders uh, are going this route, which is why... I, uh, I'm talking about this. Otherwise, I wouldn't. And so, something new is about to happen, man. Amen. I'll read Psalm 126 at the end. It's such a fascinating psalm, and it's for Carmel. I'll read it at the end. Don't flip there yet. The third thing that um, Jesus said would 
bring a people called Christians to function the way he wants, to func- wants them to function is prayers. And he didn't mean prayer for healing and for jobs. That was part of it. But when he meant prayer, he meant the kind of prayer which knows the will of God and then brings it to pass here in Bristol, not so much for your sake, but for the sake of those outside. Amen. Where you take scriptures like Isaiah 45, verse 1 to 3, and you begin to pray that, Oh God, there are bars of iron that need to be broken so that the treasures of darkness can be taken out. And these treasures of darkness are not pounds hid under some rich man's bed. These are people that have been held captive by the demonic for years who, because of you going into places that nobody in the Carmel staff can go to, get set free. Someone did that for me, I got to do it for someone. And it becomes my daily thing, eh? It's not, it's not a mission Sunday thing. It's not a mission month thing. It is my mission. Yeah. Every month serves my mission. The mission does not serve the month. <laughs> and then the last thing Jesus threw in is, while you're doing these four things, getting used to, accustomed to a common set of teachings so that you all smell like the shepherd, as in the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, Christ. Two, that you begin to openly declare the death and the resurrection of Christ through the breaking of bread or through publicly declaring it. Three, that you actually engage in this thing called one anothering for your sake and for the sake of the world. And four, that you begin to engage in prayers where you declare my will into Bristol where things begin to break down. Uh, City Hall begins to change. Different things begin to happen. Guys, we haven't seen this. So when we talk about this, it sounds like a pipe dream. But you've been around long enough and you are strong enough and you have a voice and platform to show the rest of Europe what this looks like. Small churches can't, but Carmel can. You've got such a loud voice. You've got such connections. It takes one church to model this. One church to model this and it catches. But it requires that I set aside every other form of Christianity because everything else will complicate this one thing we must do. Thank you for the enthusiastic amens. (laughs) And so they continue daily, it says in 246. So they continue daily with one accord. And here's how they continued. They did meet in the temple, but they also met in homes. They also met in homes, breaking bread and obeying what was given to them by the Holy Spirit. So they did meet in the temple, meaning on Sundays, the first day of the week, they would gather together like this in this building that Carmel has. But during the week, they would actually have these things called house churches, not home groups not Bible studies, not care groups, not cell groups, actual churches meeting in homes. In Ephesians 2.19, you see that the word household was just another word used very frequently in the Bible for a church that meets in the home. It was a much smaller group because most homes were small. That aside, a leader could not take care of more than five to eight to ten families. If you were Jesus-like, and some of you perhaps are, you could take care of twelve. But when the group gets smaller, you suddenly realize that you have nowhere to hide. That relationships get stronger over a period of time. That your gifts are actually being noticed. That you have a safe place to practice a dangerous gift. That someone is actually interested in your life. God knew this. He knew that in 2018, we'd be so connected through Facebook and so disconnected in real life that the idea of households was not an archaic first century idea, but a very present strength in a time of trouble like this. This was his plan. He's an eternal God. He does not work in terms of centuries. He's not a middle-aged God. He thought far ahead and knew that there was a time coming 
when people would be so disconnected that they would only gather together on a Sunday. They do not know each other's names because there are 200 or 300 people and it is humanly impossible to remember them all. That they usually smile and they would use the word brother and sister because they don't know each other's names. (laughs) That they wouldn't know what to talk about. And if you were living in the UK, you couldn't even talk about the weather because it's the same, same. (laughs) So they would have to use phrases like, praise the Lord, brother. And that was the beginning and the end of it. And to avoid that, he set you up 2,000 years ago. So these households, you can read about, you can go check them out. 1 Corinthians 1.11 talks about a household. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16.15 talks about households. 2 Timothy 4.19 talks about households. 2 Timothy 4, sorry, Philippians 4.22 talks about households. Romans 16, verse 10, verse 11 talks about households. Guys like Aquila and Priscilla who had households in Corinth, in Rome, and Ephesus. Guys like Onesiphorus who was probably a slave had a household. There was another lady who used to be a stewardess in Herod's palace and she had a household and that household is perhaps a little bigger than the rest because she had more space because most other people had smaller spaces. It would be highly inconvenient to have 20, 30 people sitting together cramped up but they loved it, they longed for it. This is why a guy like Eutychus who sat in one of these cramped households started kind of getting sleepy and given the fact that they had no electricity and the lamps were burning for nine hours because Paul had preached for ten, fell off the first floor and died and came back to life. This is what God was building then and this is what he still wants to build because nothing in the New Testament is old. That's why it's called the New Testament. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It's called the New Testament for different reasons but (laughs) nothing in it is old. So households is something that this church, I believe, has decided to go down. But just because a church decides to go down that road doesn't mean that the people in the church necessarily want to. I've said this before, but I go to a church which has 25,000 people in the English congregation. The total number of people in the church is 55,000, 25,000 in the English congregation. They've been doing households for years. They've got 95 households. But only 1,800 people from the 25,000 actually attend households. Why? Because we have gotten so used to the convenience of Sunday church that anything else is an interruption. And it is easy to hide in a large church like this. I don't know your problems. I don't know your actual condition of Christianity. I don't know the sins you're engaged in or not engaged in. I don't know your gifts. I don't know how you're doing with your wife and children. I don't know your financial situation. I don't know anything about you. And some of us would want it known. Some of us don't want it known. Households then become a hard thing to attend. And it's worse for the leaders eh, of these households because the leaders don't necessarily have degrees. They haven't done this thing before and they're shivering in their pants when they'll be called up later today. (laughs) And if they're not shivering in their pants, it's the wrong response. (laughs) Because either they haven't been told about how difficult this is going to be or they are overconfident and they'll find out tomorrow. (laughs) The appropriate response to any appointment by God is to fall down on your face and start shaking so that you can hear him saying, do not fear. So I would suggest to you, church, that when Carmel begins to launch this thing called households, and it'll happen today, that you actually begin to start knocking on the door, saying, let me in, let me in, because I want to be everything that Christ wants me to be, and Sunday ain't cutting it, because nobody can sustain a Christian life through this kind of food, even though the preacher may be brilliant. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to point at myself. (laughs) Because you can't sustain yourself. It's impossible. Nobody does this. We we would never do this in the world. 
You can't. I, 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 you might say, but I worship at home and I uh, read the Bible at home. Good for you. But here's the thing, guys. You are part of the body of Christ. Forgive me if I've shared this before, but there's this lady I knew called Gisela who used to come to church and when, you would, when she would come to church, she'd walk in and you wouldn't think there was anything wrong with her. And then she would put her foot up and then you would realize that from knee downwards, her foot was a prosthetic foot. And then when she'd go to sleep at night, she would take off that prosthetic foot, put it on the side and then go to sleep without that foot. That is what happens to us around 12.30 every Sunday. We come in walking as a part of the body. And then as soon as service is over, we disconnect that limb, put it aside. Because from Monday to Saturday, we live a life that has nothing to do with the body of Christ. And we polish and shine that prosthetic foot with Bible reading and worship. But it is still a prosthetic foot. Because the life flows from the head. And if one is not connected to the body, do not for a moment think that you are getting the full deal. Because Psalm 133 says, the oil that is poured upon the, hood now, uh, on the head now flows down to the body. I cannot disconnect when the closing song is sung. I cannot. This is why... Paul would actually expel people from the church when they would blaspheme and try to break up the church. He would say, throw him out of the church. Why? Because you and I have no idea how much protection is yours because you're a part of Carmel. Yeah. We have no idea. When you become part of the body of Christ, what flows from the head now begins to affect the rest of who you are. It doesn't matter that you be a member of Carmel or somewhere else, but find a body to attach yourself to. This is not some kind of recruitment drive for Carmel. I'd suggest to you that by, this time, by the time this thing gets going, there'll be fewer people here than now. These kind of messages always make the church smaller. Because <laughs> now, where will you hide if you are the hiding type? But imagine the other side. Imagine meeting in little households. This happens on a Sunday, but imagine meeting in little households with people you don't know initially and leaders you probably don't think of much, think much of. Imagine how difficult it's going to be. There will be times when you know things about certain topics more than the leaders do. But you learn this thing called order. And sometimes you have to suffer quietly while you learn order. Jesus had to. He had Joseph and Mary to take care of him. Even he didn't get a break on it. And so you learn order. But as you begin to spend time with each other, you realize that, huh, Wayne ain't as bad as I thought he looks up there. And then I find that as I begin to attend his group, uh, 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 we're just talking about a fictitious group now. Um, uh, when I begin to attend his group, Wayne begins to take a serious interest in my um, life. He just doesn't meet me on the day that I go to his house for this household. He actually calls me the next day to ask how I'm doing. Initially, I don't say much because I still don't know him. But he makes it a habit now to look into my life. As he does, I begin to open up my life to him. Because of the wisdom that he has, he begins to offer me little nuggets that begins to change my life. Sure. And now I take my wife, again a fictitious character, and I go to this fictitious group to meet with the only real thing in this whole picture, which is Wayne. <laughs> but, now <laughs> but now I go to their home and I sit with him and his wife and they begin to share how their marriage works. I don't tell him anything about my marriage, but I begin to get things from his marriage that I begin to use in mine. The next time we meet for a house group, he just turns in the middle of the service and asks me to share a story that I had told him. And I begin to share it. And for the first time in my life, my Christianity begins to mean something because I'm not one of those guys who has to put something in the tithing basket as it goes by. I now have a story, a story that usually will not be heard. 
And as I begin to speak, Wayne notices in me an ability to speak that I myself didn't know. Wayne now begins to pray with his wife saying, what is it, O God, that you have in Jacob? And God begins to show Wayne the kind of person Jacob is, that one day Jacob has the ability to pioneer things in nations. And he begins to talk to me about it. One day he and his wife lay hands on me and say, you will go to the nations. Suddenly the gifts and the grace in me, the ability and the potential in me begins to get released. Something that would have stayed hidden in a large church now begins to happen. This is the opportunity being presented to you. Who will you be? Will you be Erastus, the chief financial officer of a city in Rome who had the ability to get Paul through difficult situations into nations? Will you be Phoebe, the benefactor who underwrote many of Paul's trips, was a patron and at the same time was a messenger? Will you be Timothy, who walked along with Paul, who was chosen from a household in Ephesus along with Titus from Greece and they both went with Paul? Will you be Aquila and Priscilla whose only job was starting businesses in different cities and once they would start that business, they would open their homes and gather together a church and then get a leader to take care of the church, shut down the business, go to the next city. Will you be Epaphroditus who was sent by Paul to encourage people in some other church? Who are you? Who are you? What role do you play in his big story? Don't you want to find out? My God, if you were defined by the job you do, janitor, doctor, engineer, what good is that? There is a much bigger story, much bigger story that God wants to write, that he's already written. He's already written it. It's waiting to be discovered. And in these small households, through leaders who are fearful and inadequate, unqualified, and who only have willing hearts and the spirit of God to help them, Your treasure will come to the top. Your trash will be destroyed too. Because it's hard to hide when there is no room to hide. Where strongholds will become obvious. Where you can start knocking down those strongholds. Where pet sins that have stayed for years, now now they begin to disappear. Because someone's seriously interested. Not someone, some Uh, now, Now a group of people are interested in seeing you do well. This doesn't mean that you will be exposed. No, in these little groups, everything is built through relationship. Everything is built through relationship. This will take time. But thank God your leaders are willing to spend time. It's going to take time, guys. But when did you ever build a relationship without time? Jesus is so relational... It is a cornerstone of his dealings with everything and everyone. I bet Jonah started relating to the whale at some point. (laughs) Kidding, kidding, moving on. (laughs) Imagine a household where spiritual songs happen. I mean, I'm using words like spiritual songs because you'll find them in Colossians and Ephesians. When you meet together, someone... Guys, we, we, we have this happening. I'm not talking about theory now. I've seen this already happening in different parts of the world. If you ever want to see it happening real, come to Vancouver. You'll see it. Where people gather in a household and, 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 and there are songs and sometimes there is no Nathan. And so there is no guitar or keyboard or a great voice. Yeah. But there are voices. Yeah. And they learn to sing in harmony and they sing without instruments. But instruments are nice. When they get their first instrument, they are thrilled. <coughs> you get together, spiritual songs happen. We, we, we send out emails saying, what are you bringing to church next week? And it doesn't mean some kind of a dish or uh, cookies. We're talking about, what are you bringing? Are you bringing a spiritual song? Or are you bringing a reading of the word? Are you bringing a prophetic word that you have pondered on and that you have decided you need to bring? What gift will be expressed through you? What teaching? What kind of ministry? Are you bringing the ingredients for the breaking of the bread? Are you bringing a stranger? What are you bringing? What are you bringing? What did we bring this morning except our tithes? This was never the way the church was supposed to happen. How are you involved? The only guys involved are Nathan, Mike Fletcher, and me. 
And anyways, the ushers and the sound guys never counted. I'm kidding. They could switch me off right now and things would go really dark. <laughs> but we don't notice them, that's what I meant. And the rest of us just do not have a chance to have the Christ in us come out and express himself for the benefit of others. Yeah. This is so wrong, man. This was not how church was supposed to be. And thank God, Carmel has the guts to change it. Because trust me, doing it this way is far easier, more convenient, and it's a happy place. And what you are planning to do is going to be messy. This is when you shout hallelujah. hallelujah. <laughs> I'll have Daryl come and do that later. Yeah. And then, what about uh, building teams and sending them to different parts? Yeah. To Zambia, to Na Nairobi. We have, we have guys from different households going to Kenya, going to India. Why? Because now each household wants to do something. You've just found out what you're good at. Yeah. And it's not your boss who told you that. It's Jesus who told you that. That there's not a single person sitting here, which is nuts. Not a single person sitting here who does not have something that I need or we need. Yes. You break bread, you invite strangers. Invite strangers not to church so that the pastor can deal with it. You invite strangers to your home first into your marriage so that they can see how you, your marriage works, and then you invite them to the household. The last place you bring them to is Carmel, where people speak in strange languages, some sing, and then they ask for money. <laughs> That's not the right place to bring a stranger. <laughs> We've gotten so used to this that we don't think it's weird, but it is kind of weird if you brought me into a place like that. Teachers will emerge, prophets will emerge, apostles will emerge. Amen. Not because they print a business card, but because they actually function in it. Yes. Just imagine that. You don't know how many teachers, apostles, prophets, pastors, and evangelists have died in the pews. Because some of us rule the roost and get paid for it. Hey guys, here's the thing, eh? if you define yourself by your work, you'll only get what you deserve. Yeah. And that is if you have a good boss or you have a good company. Yeah. But when you begin to define yourself in his story, you will find that God begins to provide for you in ways you don't understand. Yeah. You never get what you deserve. You n I, have yet to be, I have yet to receive exactly what I deserve. I always get more than I deserve and I'm getting used to it. New songs will arise. There's this guy called Mark uh, in one of the households in Vancouver. And a uh, guy picked up the guitar two months ago and wrote a song on uh, one of the prophetic words today, Ezekiel 37, Dry Bones. He wrote a song. And it is so good. And he can't sing. Eh? His guitar playing is terrible. He plays worse than me. And uh, he can't sing. But he came up with this beautiful song, has a tune to it, had the guts to come up and sing it. And it was terrible. But <laughs> I hope he isn't watching. <laughs> but here's the thing, guys. That song is so powerful that now we're calling him up to sing every Sunday so that the church learns it. I could easily give it to the worship leader and ask him to do it. But somehow it would rob something of the song. So Mark comes up. And you'll find when these household happens that uh, excellence takes a lesser value. Yeah. Excellence takes a lesser value. It's, it'll be more about the person than the excellence. Because if I give you 100 pounds and I give someone else 200 pounds and tell them to build a house, the guy with 200 pounds might build a better house because he has more money to spend. But the guy with a hundred pounds may do a great job and only Jesus can see the difference. 
Excellence is sometimes an external measure. But when Mark comes and sings there, even though everything about the song and his guitaring isn't good, there is something about the way he sings it that is so, so spirit of God. God wants to say to both of you guys, you both, that he didn't send you to this land so that you can settle here. He sent you here so that he could use this as a base to send you to different nations. And that you've been through the fire and you've come out refined. And God is just waiting to set you ablaze. Waiting to set you ablaze. God has watched how you guys really like each other and it is your greatest strength. You guys are actually in love with each other. And God is saying this to you. That because you have built well and you've been refined by the fire, get ready because I really itch to set you ablaze. If you get what God is saying. Yeah. And so do not put down your roots so deep that when it comes time for God to send you out to different places and return, that you say no because we are too stuck in what we're doing. And I would also just suggest to you that if you are part of Carmel, meet with the leaders and say, can you help train us in what we are good at? And if you aren't part of Carmel, then find a place where you can be trained. Because you can't go as mavericks. You'll have to be sent people. Yeah? Okay. Guys, shh. Okay, I got to kind of begin to wrap up. Um, How do we go about doing this? It's very simple. We do it every day. Here are the simple ways of uh, reaching out to the rest of the nations. Seek people out. Seek people out. Tomorrow, when you go to work, seek people out. What does seeking people out look like? Notice people. Notice Wayne. Notice Daryl. Notice Claire. Notice Vicky as they walk past you. Watch. Because we love looking at mountains, flowers, birds, and that's great. But the apex of God's creation was man. And we always ignore man. We stop to smell the roses, but we don't look at people's faces. I love looking and finding out people's names and faces. I look at every name tag. I want to call them by name. God loves calling things by name. He called the animals by name, man. Much more you. Seek people out. Jesus had this strange ability to locate people, to look them in the eye, and it would do something to them. It didn't matter whether these were women who had five husbands or a prostitute caught in the act or a short man on a tree or a man who was just cheating you off your taxes. He had the ability to look you in the face and something would happen. Seek people out. These are simple things we do. The next thing is to build relationship. Build relationship and let it take two years. It's worth it. Build relationship. And if they don't want your Jesus, that's fine. Build relationship. I hate it when, uh, and this is, um, if you're selling Amway, Please continue selling it. But <laughs> I don't like it when someone spends three hours with me because they want to sell me Amway. Sell me Amway right off in the first minute and then let's talk. I'll buy it. But don't, don't fake interest in me for three hours and then sell me something after feeding me because I wouldn't know how to say no. The point is this, guys. We aren't building relationships with the intent that if you... And now that I've spent two days with you, do you want Jesus or not? No, that's it. (laughs) Build relationships because as you build relationships, they see Jesus. The definition of transparency is when your life is transparent, people see Jesus. But people can't see what's in you if you don't spend time with them. As you spend time with them, you will not need to lead them in a prayer. They will see he who is within you. They will see it. It always happens. Seek people. As you seek them, there'll be ones that actually lock into you. Why? Because before the foundations of the earth, God had ordained them into an encounter with you. You don't even have to try. Seek, build relationships, and finally open your homes. Not the church. Open your homes. And if you don't have a home, find a coffee shop. And if you don't have a coffee shop, take Ralph's place. (laughs) Really. I've never been to his place ever when it was just him and Joe there. There's always people there. 
So open your homes. Open your homes. Open your homes. It is so inconvenient. It is so not British. <laughs> but it is kingdom culture. Amen. What did Jesus say when two disciples were following him at a distance and said, Master, where do you live? He didn't give them the address. He didn't say, you can meet me at the synagogue next Saturday. He said, come and see. It is very inconvenient. It won't happen tomorrow, but it will happen because this will be something that will be emphasized. Once you seek people, not seek people out, not target them, but seek people as in you are made in the image of God. I like flowers and mountains and jumbo jets, but I really think you are it. Seek people, build relationships, open your homes. You do those three things and the rest is easy. You want to find out about it? Join a household yes. and they'll tell you the rest. And what is our intent at the end of the day, guys? And I'll wrap up with this. It's very simple. I must profess the gospel. I must penetrate places that the gospel hasn't been heard. And I must cause it to progress because Jesus said, go therefore, Nathan, and make disciples. Imagine, eh? You finally do this a year and a half from now. Someone actually says, hey, I've been hanging out with you for a year and a half and I really want this Jesus of yours. So how do I go about it? And that's when you lead them in a such a... Uh, uh, you, you, uh, you, you won't even know how to lead them because by then you'll forget the sinner's prayer. you lead them some other way. Because <laughs> yeah. the sinner's prayer is a quick fix, eh? When you build relationships, you know the person. You begin to pray like the person needs prayer, not like the person is a sinner. And then you lead the person to the Lord. And now what happens next? You baptize him. Not Daryl, not Wayne, not Mike Fletcher, not Ralph. You baptize him because you led him to the Lord. You get wet for a turn. And then they stick around with you because you begin to model to them what Christian life lives, looks like. Because he said, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then teach them to observe everything I have commanded. And how do people learn? Through modeling. They see how you live. Which then puts the demand on you, not on the paid pastoral staff. Now the demand is on you. How you do is what I do. And therefore you do wrong, I do wrong. If you're holy only on the weekend, I'm holy only on the weekend. It puts such amazing grace-filled pressure on you. Yes. Don't believe that for a second, eh? There's nothing about pressure that's amazing or grace-filled. <laughs> But it, it causes you to do well. Unless a demand is placed on the seed, the seed will not produce. This will put the demand on your Christian life. And you start this, guys. You don't have to wait for a household to remember these things. I have been set apart by Christ to assist him in setting others apart. And my primary function is to make sure that I proclaim or profess who he is. That I say that in places where the gospel has not penetrated yet. And here's my problem. I'm a pastor. Every person I know is usually a Christian or at the brink of becoming a Christian. I go to places that have scriptures stuck on the walls. Everything I hear, the music, comes from some group in either Los Angeles or Sydney. <laughs> every restaurant I go to, every barber I meet, every mechanic I meet, everybody is Christian. It is so not fun. But you have the amazing opportunity to go into places where the world is still ripe for picking. I half have a mind to say any questions, but <laughs> I don't have time. Otherwise, I'd ask you to ask questions. Guys, Carmel has what it takes. Carmel has what it takes. Your foundations are solid. You have had 20 years of solid teaching. 
You guys are guys who walk in faith. Half the things that I've taught in Acts 29, not half the thing, a quarter of the things that I've taught in Acts 29 I learned from Pastor Jerry. We had a Bible school, we stole stuff from you. <laughs> we mentioned it to Pastor Jerry after we stole it though. <laughs> the point is this, you've already had years of foundations laid guys. Now we got to break this mold of church because this ain't church. It is what's being repeated in a million places this morning. And it does nothing for us. Just to think that there are 300 or 400 people sitting here who didn't get a chance to express their gifts, who didn't get a chance to contribute anything to the service, who will not get it for the rest of the year who will live vicariously through their children during the Christmas play. <laughs> we'll never get a sing up here. We'll never write a song that will be sung. We'll never get a sit in the first two seats, rows, if that is what you're aiming at. The point is this, guys, that this is not what Jesus had for us and how dare we mess with his bride. What gives me and you the, the audacity to mess with the way he wanted his bride built? Thank God your leaders are willing to change this. But now that they are willing, we will not have an excuse. Now that they are willing, see, it, 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 it's, it's a common thing in churches. Ah, if only those leaders would. Because it's always their fault, and usually it is. But <laughs> now that we've come to a place where the leaders are willing to change the mold, what will we as people do? Will we respond or still stay on the fringes? And so households is something that's coming to Carmel. I just want to read out Psalm 126, and then I'm done. I'll just put the word Carmel in every time I read it. And this is a word for Carmel. And uh, while we were worshiping, I thought, gosh, Lord, if this is what you're going to do, this is awesome. Then the Lord brought back uh, the captivity of Zion. We were like those who dream. Uh, and then here's what God says to Carmel from verse 2 onwards. Your mouths will be filled with laughter, your tongue with singing. They shall say among the nations, the Lord has done great things for Carmel. L the Lord has done great things for Carmel, and they are glad. Bring back, O oh God, our fortunes as the streams in the Negev. Carmel may have sown in tears over the last few years. The last couple of years may have been rough. But here's the thing. You have sown in tears. It is your turn now to reap in joy. Amen. You went forth in weeping, but you bore seed even through your weeping. And now you shall come back bringing sheaves with you. Psalm 126 is your heritage. God wants to restore your fortunes to an extent where other nations will say, what is it that they have that we can now take? And so household is something that God's going to build here through your leaders. And uh, I'll just hang around while Ralph takes over. <laughs>